All right, here we are in Love for Life, building or rebuilding a great marriage. This is lesson number five in the series and the title for this particular lesson, Holy Sex, part two, part two. Uh, so uh, um, the basic principle that I um, am talking about here, or the basic premise that I'm talking about in this course, is that if God has given us you know, marriage to be something that lasts for a lifetime, then He's also given us the tools to maintain the love that we need in order to you know, be married for a, a whole life. I don't think that God designed marriage so that there could be some love there for two or three years and then after that, you know, nothing you know, for, for the next 45 years. So I think you know, love for life and uh, uh, marriage for life, but also love for life. Uh, but the tools that we need you know, to remain that way, that's, uh, I think those things are learned and that's, uh, that's one of the things that we're trying to do in this, uh, in this particular class. Uh, learn some of the tools that we need in order to maintain that loving relationship uh, for life. Okay, so let's uh, kind of review some of the ideas that uh, we've had so far in the uh, course. First idea was that spirituality and sexuality are connected. You know, some people say, wow, you know, why are you talking about this in church? Why are we talking about sex in church? Because there is a spiritual component to our intimate sexual life in marriage. And so we've been discussing that uh, in this particular course. Another thing that we talked about is that God has designed human sexuality for physical purposes that we, I think, are aware of, for procreation, certainly, to have children, but also for comfort and for pleasure, for human fulfillment. God has designed human sexuality for all of these things. But He's also designed it for a spiritual purpose. And the spiritual purpose for human sexuality is to create oneness between two people. Um, so um, uh, this idea of oneness, this is the spiritual side of human sexuality. That's why I said last week, uh, in my opinion, um, you know, there was a, a question about uh, you know, having children. We said that sex is to have children, so on and so forth. And I, I, I mentioned that you know, um, there, there are other ways to have children today that we're not you know, we're not uh, present a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago, nobody ever asked one, an elder or a preacher, uh, is it okay you know, to have artificial insemination? That just didn't, that wasn't something humanly possible a hundred years ago. And so, you know, uh, when those questions started to arise in our generation, uh, we had to find biblical principles in order to help us, guide us through these new uh, physical and um, uh, medical uh, technologies. And so one of the principles in the Bible is uh, the idea of oneness, the one flesh principle. Man and women, man and woman come together and they are one flesh. And we always think that the only thing that kind of divides that or separates that is adultery, and it does. But the one flesh principle also guides us in other matters as well. And I want to uh, perhaps uh, uh, give a little more detail on this than I did last week. Uh, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, uh, if uh, uh, couples have children using a variety of technologies to do so, then from a spiritual perspective, they're using the one flesh principle to guide them in this. So someone, for example, uh, uh, the male, let's say, the, the man in the, in the equation here, is not able to have children or a low sperm count or so on and so forth. I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to get into all the medical uh, details of it. But let's say um, uh, they, uh, you know, in a clinic, they take his sperm and they take his wife's egg and they, you know, uh, they put these together and then they put it back inside of uh, the wife. Uh, there's no violation here of the one flesh principle. It's still the husband it's still the wife. They're simply doing in an artificial way what they can't do in a physical way. You understand what I'm saying? But the, the, the principle of the one flesh is not violated. It's still him, it's still her. They're simply manipulating the way that they're going to conceive. 
The other question that comes up, well, how about if uh, uh, the man uh, cannot have children, no children at all, no way to impregnate his wife. How about if we go to a sperm bank and we just get an anonymous sperm from someone else and impregnate the wife and they have a baby? What's wrong with that? Is that adultery? Well, no, of course not. That's not adultery. But it does, in my opinion, violate that one flesh principle. So you need to have biblical principles to help you decide certain areas which are which are not easy uh, to decide. Anyways, this class is not about that, but uh, just to let you know uh, that there are principles in the Bible that do guide us in these areas where there's a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. All right, so we said that uh, God designed human sexuality for physical purposes, for spiritual purposes, to create the uh, oneness between uh, two people. Also said that um, when this uh, oneness um, is achieved, it in turn opens the door to deeper understanding of spiritual realities, such as the true image of man created to reflect God's image, a kind of a return to the garden idea, or the experience and nature of Christ's relationship with the church, which is to, uh, the church which is to come and last forever. Also, the ultimate private honoring of God and His creation. So what I'm saying is that the oneness achieved through human sexuality also enables us to understand more deeply some of the spiritual truths that are taught in the Bible, especially uh, the spiritual truths uh, that are based on the idea of uh, the relationship between God and the church and so on and so forth. Also, we talked about uh, something else. We said, because God created sex to lead us to the spiritual truth that I've been talking about, this act and the relationship that surrounds it is holy or it's sacred, as well as things specifically created by God for spiritual purposes. So you know, the ark was holy. You know, in the Old Testament, the ark of the covenant was holy. I mean, it was just an object, wasn't it? It was something man made. But it was holy because God designed it and He had a special purpose for it. The things that were in the temple, again, they were just cups and, and, and forks you know, to use to, to make the, the, the sacrifices, but they were considered holy. Why? Because God designed those things and He gave them a special purpose. And so in the same way, human sexuality is a holy thing because God is the one who designed it. Man's not the one who invented sex, God invented sex. And he designed it for a specific, for a specific purpose. And so uh, to use it not in the way that God designed it, this is what makes it unholy. For example, to use sexuality uh, for power, you know, like in, in cases of rape, that's, what, that's what's immoral about it. Or to use it to make money, you know, pornography, and, prostitution. You know, someone says, where's the problem? You know, it's a victimless crime you know, and nobody gets hurt and so on and so forth. Well, you know, the, the state can figure out all the reasons why it's uh, illegal. But from a spiritual perspective, it's not allowed simply because it's using human sexuality in a way that God said not to use it. Okay? So um, that's why I say not all sex is holy. So when we misuse human sexuality in any way, its power turns against us, and instead of empowering us to oneness and deeper spiritual truth and experience, we are blinded and we're left empty. You know this word empty, interesting, I, I saw a um, documentary once about uh, prostitution. They were, they were interviewing uh, women who had been in this uh, this, uh, I, I don't want to even call it work, you know, but in this activity, and uh, just talking to them about their life. And, and one of the words that kept coming up throughout the interviews, the women said they felt empty. It had robbed them of something and they couldn't put their finger on it, but we know what it had robbed them of. It had robbed them of their spiritual identity as, as people, as, uh, as individuals created in the image of God. They had used human sexuality in a way that it was not designed to be used. And so the power that it has didn't work for them, it actually worked against them. Okay, so we've talked about oneness through sex, 
But that doesn't mean that oneness happens automatically when two people have sex. You know, there's a learning curve to all of this. So I want to kind of share the, the learning curve here a little bit. Now, in some of the material that I'm using for this class, there, were, uh, there are several uh, counseling case studies used to provide background information about you know, couples and so on and so forth. And I want to share uh, part of one of these counseling case studies to, uh, you know, to set up my next point. So what you're going to see, you probably got them in your notes there, but what you're going to see up on the board is a dialogue between uh, 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 an actual case study of uh, a psychologist. All right, I think they may have changed the names or something like that. Uh, and you see the dialogue between these two people, married people, and uh, the problems that they're having and how the therapist is uh, dealing with them. So let's, we're going to read through this case study and only take a minute or two and then we're going to make some comments on it. Okay, so let's start. It says, uh, Brenda kept apologizing for the feelings she was sharing. She didn't want to hurt her husband, Kevin, but she kept her thoughts hidden for too long. Now, for the sake of her marriage, she was glad that everything was finally coming out. Kevin was sitting next to Brenda in my counseling office, but he wished he could be somewhere else. I know I'm not supposed to exaggerate, Brenda began, but it seems that every time we're alone, Kevin makes some sexually suggestive comment aimed at getting me to have sex with him. I feel like he must spend his days coming up with new lines to try to get me to say yes. And if it's not a comment, it's a grab. I can be cooking or doing the dishes and he'll come up behind me and plant both his hands on my breasts. A hug would be great, but he can't seem to touch me without it being in a, a, an erogenous zone. Now Kevin really wanted to be somewhere else. Brenda assured me that she didn't hate sex. I can get aroused and sometimes I even have an orgasm, but the more Kevin pushes, the less I want to have sex. The more he talks about doing it, the more I feel that sex between us is just that, a cold impersonal it. And have you been begun to feel uh, like an it too, I asked? Yes, yes, I have, she says. Now Kevin wanted me to be somewhere else. And so Brenda's story is another sad example of how much we're missing in our sex lives. By losing sight of sex as a holy act, we're depriving ourselves of the richness and deep satisfaction that God designed it to provide. Since sex is invested with so much spiritual meaning uh, that should affect the way we approach our moments of sexual intimacy, but how? When we acknowledge the truth that sex on God's terms is sacred, we can stop fighting about frequency, positions, and who initiates it. And that's taken from a book uh, entitled Sacred Sex by uh, Gardner. All right, well, here's the thing. The thing that Kevin didn't get in this little dialogue here, and that Brenda was searching for without being able to articulate it, was the idea that the number one purpose for sex is not procreation or recreation, it's unification. It's unification. This unification, this oneness, goes beyond the actual physical unity that is experienced in the sex act. And this guy here, Kevin, he wasn't getting it. As a matter of fact, the physical sexual union is actually an outward manifestation of a deeper and more powerful spiritual reality that's taking place. In other words, it's not just about sex. So in this context, the sex act becomes a celebration of the soul deep bond that is present when a couple knows and experiences the certainty that they are together permanently and together permanently for divine purposes, not just physical purposes. There's something very encouraging in the idea <clears throat> that we're in it for the long run that we're in it for the duration, that we're in it no matter what happens, we're in it together, we're in this together. There's something very powerful uh, when that idea, when the couple shares that idea, and when that idea is really you know, innermost in each of these people's hearts, that becomes the basis for a, a more, um, what's the word, a more satisfying 
physical union. But if, if there's any doubt in that basis, it's very hard to have satisfying sex. When you're not sure of your partner, you know, if you're not sure that your partner's in it, then it's very hard to let go when it comes to sexual intimacy. In order for sex in marriage to become an actual celebration of the deeper oneness shared, the couple must have a shared life emotionally and physically outside of their sexual union as well. Remember what I said this a while back, women, women need intimacy first before they can move themselves emotionally to have a satisfying, freeing sexual experience. And men are the opposite. Men need to have a satisfying sexual experience in order to experience intimacy. And that neither way is right or wrong. It's simply the way that we're designed. And I think God designed us this way because it forces us to compromise. We have to compromise. So in the case of Brenda and Kevin, they could not connect sexually because their focus was not on oneness, but rather on their individual needs and desires. So Kevin was absorbed in his physical impulses and he remained focused on orgasm. I want release. And Brenda became focused on self preservation and maintaining her self-respect. In other words, you want, you want orgasm, I want you to respect me. Well, you know, when two people have those ideas, they're not going to get together very often or very well. So everything about their sexual encounters, both in bed and out, was a battle for achievement of their individual goals and desires, not for their mutual benefit. They weren't working to make the the we part of us work, they were working to make their individual needs work. They were learning the hard lesson that whenever we make orgasm the goal of sex, we fail to experience godly or holy sex. And this is the issue where masturbation comes in. Masturbation has some benefits as far as sexual release is concerned for those who have no spouse or their spouse is not accessible, they're separated from their spouse because of illness or distance or whatever reasons. But the problem with it is that it can't produce oneness unless it's shared with our spouse. Even that activity does not produce satisfaction unless it's shared <laughs> with our partner. Now, many individuals focused only on orgasm, people like Kevin here in our example, they turn to the combination of pornography and masturbation in a search for satisfaction. I don't know how many guys, mostly guys, some women, but mostly guys. I don't know how many guys that I've known who have kind of gotten to this. You know, well, it gets me through. You know, I mean, I've even you know, had the situation where you know, she goes to bed at 10.30 because she's tired, she's been with the kids and blah, 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 and he's, you know, she's tired, she's not available, so he, he stays up till midnight, you know, flipping through the channels, waiting until he finds something good. So this is, a this is terrible because it pushes them further away from their partners and the true satisfaction that they crave. And it creates an addiction to a powerful stimulant that only enslaves, but here's the, here's the money shot, it enslaves, but it doesn't satisfy. I mean, the only thing masturbation in this type of situation, the only thing it produces is guilt, that's all. So the experience of oneness in sex can only be achieved if we share every part of our lives together and then celebrate this unity through sexual oneness. In other words, if we're not one out of bed, we can never be one in bed. I can't make it any simpler than that. In other words, the big O in sexual experience is not orgasm, it's oneness. You can't get to orgasm without oneness. 
All right, so let's talk about that. The idea that human sexuality was created to produce oneness, this is a biblical idea. And it's one that's recognized by many people in the ancient world as well as in the modern, in the modern world. You know, we in our sex-saturated society of the last hundred years, we've gone away from this concept and we've reaped the consequences. High divorce rates, more blended families, increased pornography, sexual abuse, dysfunctional families, sexual confusion, you know, homosexuality, that's sexual confusion, other sexual disorders. In the past, however, and in other cultures, this, this oneness idea was embraced. It's not like I'm talking about something that's brand new. I mean, this, this, is, this is as old as Genesis, this idea of oneness. For example, the Jews had a word. For them, sex was the ultimate bonding experience. And in the Hebrew, the word yada is often used to describe sex between a man and a woman. It means to know by observation, to know by reflection, and by experiencing. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Well, we know what he means there by that word know, it means he knew her intimately, right? Same word, by the way, you know, Jesus says, and you will know God, same word. You will know Him intimately. So in the Hebrew, yada, well, the only way we know yada today, right, is from Seinfeld. You know, they would say, oh, yada, yada, it meant, and so on and so forth. So they took a word that was rich in meaning in the, you know, in the intimate life of a couple, and they kind of cheapened it and made it just a little byword for something, for something else. Um, in another example of this, in another culture, um, in another culture, in the Dutch language, the slang word for sex is naim, naim which means to sew. You sew two pieces of cloth together so that long after the sewing is done, the two pieces remain closely knit together as one. And so, <coughs> excuse me, so God sews us together in marriage through human sexuality. And in this way, we become one without losing our individuality. Remember, God's the one that did this. Marital sex works as a circle of oneness. Having been joined by oneness of intercourse, that union affects every other aspect of our relationship. Feeling cherished and valued in other parts of our lives creates the desire to be one again with our mates through sex. In God's design, sex creates oneness and oneness fosters a climate of unity and love that circles around to create more and better sex. You know, it just keeps going round and round. Remember I said, if, if you have oneness out of, you know, out of intimate sexual relations, then you'll have oneness within it. The idea is you have to work at the oneness on the outside before the oneness takes place on the inside. All right, well, what about the other O? <coughs> Excuse me. I've talked a lot about the spiritual nature of human sexuality, but not much about its physical nature. And yet our primary experience is physical, is it not? So I used the example from the previous lesson that God would have designed a way to achieve oneness without the use of sex or the experience of orgasm. But He, but he didn't do that. <laughs> that he didn't do, you know, we could have had children in a different way. We, we, he could have designed some other thing, you know, maybe we, we touch foreheads and go, oh, we're one. You know. He didn't do that. He designed this complicated, you know, kind of embarrassing thing you know, called sex. It wasn't embarrassing when he created it, but you don't understand what I'm saying. He's the one who did this. Like I said before, when pursued for its own pleasure, Sexual experience will always follow the law of diminishing return, always, always. For example, 
the first powerful orgasm experienced through individual masturbation will yield less and less power and pleasure if constantly repeated. Or the first powerful climax experienced through premarital sex or homosexual sex or adultery or any form of illicit sex will only produce less and less power and pleasure until newer and more depraved experiences are created. There was a time, believe it or not, that the catalogs that we get from Sears or Kohl's or wherever, you know, that show the underwear section, you know, where the women are modeling undergarments, there was a time that that was like soft porn. That men looked at that and were around. Today it's like whatever, you know, today, you, you, never mind in the magazine, you see some women actually dressed like that on the street, which just tells you the diminishing power. Today there is needed a much more powerful stimulant, if you wish, to appeal to the purient interest of an individual. The pursuit of oneness affects not only the way that we think about sex, but the way we experienced it as well. So for those who pursue oneness through sex, each partner abandons control of their own orgasm to their partner at the moment that they feel most vulnerable. So now I'm talking about the spiritual and the physical and the emotional when these things all come, all come together. Listen to what Paul says. He says, the husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This business of oneness and the pursuit of oneness that will bring us to what we want really in, you know, as a physical experience, that's what Paul is talking about. The word duty here, you know, the duty you have to your wife, your husband, it comes from a word that means debt or to owe something. So the husband, Paul says, owes his wife the pleasure that she needs to be satisfied because this duty has been given to him by God and vice versa. The body, and this includes the erogenous zones, does not belong to the person, it belongs to the spouse. My wife is responsible for my pleasure and my fulfillment, not me. And I am responsible for hers. And so in sexual union, my focus is her pleasure, not my own. And her focus is my pleasure, not her own. Do you see how this works here? You see the balance of this? Remember, this doesn't come from some you know, sexologist. It comes from the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago. Don't you think that people were wrestling with this human sexuality issue 2,000 years ago in marriage? Why do you think he wrote this? He wrote this because people were asking him questions. Married people were having issues about their intimate sexual lives. And so he, he answers their question. Now let's go a little bit deeper, shall we? This is why people who struggle with control issues, people who struggle with control issues and with trusting their mate, they also usually have trouble reaching orgasm. They're always on guard. They're never wanting to give up the control or the responsibility for their own pleasure to their mate. And so many times they end up blaming their mate because you know, they're not receiving what they think they should have. And the problem is really with them. They don't let go. But it's when we abandon ourselves and control to our mate 
and trust them with our most vulnerable state that the full union of physical oneness is most deeply experienced. We can reach this transparent, vulnerable, totally open state with our mates because of one reason. We know and we believe that the orgasmic experience that we hope for in sex has been created by God Himself and available through oneness with our spouse. In other words, let me break it down even more simply, what we're seeking is a good thing. It's not a naughty thing or something I shouldn't, I'm so embarrassed, I feel, wow, man, you know, I just went crazy there for a minute, I'm so embarrassed, I shouldn't do that, I shouldn't. No. <laughs> what I'm searching for here is something that God created for me. And He's given me the power to experience it and He's put into the hands of my spouse the responsibility to bring me there. And it works also the other way around. We can take the risk of vulnerability and openness and abandonment because God has chosen this as the pathway to physical and sexual fulfillment with our mates. We can trust Him that this is not only the right way to have sex, it's the only way to be completely satisfied physically, emotionally, and spiritually. You know, when you talk about sex with your wife or husband, this, these are the kind of things that we need to be discussing and talking about, not position, you know, whatever, the mechanics. Everybody knows the mechanics. 13-year-olds know the mechanic, 10-year-olds know the mechanics. That's not, the mechanics are not the problem. The problem is the heart and the spirit. All right, so I'm going to give you some homework <laughs> for married couples. Find a time to pray together. You know, kids are gone, you have quiet. You know. Find a quiet moment to pray together. And here's what you pray. First of all, confess your sins to each other. And I don't mean 12 years ago, you know, I, uh, whatever. I was drunk and disorderly. I'm not talking about that. I mean, confess your sins to another. Examine yourselves and it's okay to say to your partner, you know what, I'm looking at myself and I see some selfishness there. I've been selfish or I've been difficult or I've been far away from you or whatever, whatever you see. Don't confess your partner's sin to your partner. <laughs> confess your sin to your partner. Very good to open up and say, I look inside and this is what I see. Then bless each other. In other words, pray for each other and bless each other. There's something very powerful you know, about asking God to give something to your partner while your partner is sitting right there and can hear what you want for them. And then Practice oneness outside of sex. Ask God to show you ways that you can be one other than sex. Because practicing oneness outside of sex leads to oneness inside of sex. And when you have oneness inside the sexual union, you get to that point where not only there's physical, great physical satisfaction, but there's also spiritual insight spiritual edification as well. All right, well this is a big topic, you know, it's hard to cover, you know, quite a complicated and large topic to cover in one lesson, but hopefully we've shared a couple of ideas here that may, may help out. All right, next week we, we completely shift gears in our series, we're going to talk about money and uh, move on in our series In Love for Life. So thank you for your attention, appreciate it.